In January 2019, President Joko Widodo of Indonesia announced the Energy and Mineral Resources Minister Regulation No. 11, which enforced an export ban on raw nickel ores from Indonesia globally. Although this decision has come with its challenges, sparking a lengthy dispute with the European Union on the legality of Indonesia's ban on nickel ore exports, it is without doubt that this decision has brought great benefits to the Indonesian economy. President Widodo recently announced that Indonesian nickel's trade value had surged from 1.08 billion US dollars to 28.8 billion US dollars in value after the export ban. Foreign direct investment in the metals industry, nickel included, reached a total of 16.1 billion US dollars in 2022, making Indonesia the biggest recipient of foreign direct investment and cementing it as a key global player in the booming electric vehicles market. Now, the Indonesian president is looking to apply similar bans to the entirety of the Indonesian metals market and further raw materials to attract investment in the processing of land-based resources. The next resource to experience the Widodo treatment is said to be bauxite, but the president's vision may soon see itself extend to the export of other commodities. Indonesia is also one of the world's largest exporters of palm oil thermal coal and tin, commodities exports which exceed 35 billion US dollars in total. By applying a protectionist agenda to these raw materials, the president hopes that these raw materials will also get the nickel experience and result in an exponential appreciation in value of the commodities. However, there are several reasons why the president's vision may not be as straightforward as it seems. The three key reasons are its ESG track record, the efficacy of the export bans, and increasing tension in trade relations. Let's start with the bad, Indonesia's ESG economics. By focusing on Indonesia's downstreaming industry, otherwise the refining of nickel metals in contrast to the export of raw nickel ore, the Indonesian economy managed to attract a whopping 3.2 billion US dollars of foreign direct investments from Chinese market players interested in securing their supply of nickel. Sounds like a good deal for the Indonesian economy, right? Not exactly. As far as investments go, Indonesia has only managed to attract substantial investments from China, with investments from from Australia, Canada, South Korea, and the US combined, totaling at just 1.5 billion US dollars over the past decade, as reported by Bloomberg UK. This signifies a general reluctance on Western investors to invest in Indonesian nickel processing. But why? There are four levels to this. Firstly, many of the processing plants rely on old technology, one example being the reliance on coal for energy to support the process by which nickel is extracted through the country's main source of nickel, laterite ore. Although Indonesian market players in the mining industry are currently planning to develop a large-scale solar plant to power the processing of nickel ores, this is a small distraction from the key issue of low-grade laterite nickel ore processing. Processing. Secondly, Indonesia's nickel ores, laterite, are a low-grade nickel ore, which is unsuitable for battery production. To produce EV battery-grade nickel, a processing method known as high-pressure acid leaching must be employed. This process results in the production of highly acidic waste, which is very difficult to manage, often resulting in disposal into water as deep-sea tailings. This has led to the deterioration of Indonesia's environment. For example, national and provincial authorities, in a show of support for the industry, approved in 2019 a request by mining company PT Trimaga Bangun Persada to dump 6 million tons of waste into the ocean each year. This has led to the depletion of biodiversity in neighboring waters and exacerbating health concerns arising out of the consumption of the remaining aquatic animals by the locals. In an attempt to curb the disposal of deep-sea tailings, the Indonesian government announced that it will no longer issue any future permits allowing for the disposal of the toxic substance. However, although the Chinese-owned processing plants have all made voluntary commitments to switching from aquatic disposals to land disposals, there are three key challenges in the short term and long term that the Indonesian government fails to address. That, one, the Indonesian government is not willing to ban the disposal of deep sea tailings outright and have not implemented proper policy guidance surrounding this. 
2. Switching disposable methods is a highly costly exercise, which in itself may create some dissatisfaction by Chinese investors. And 3. Even if the investors were willing to bear the cost, the Indonesian government merely substitutes one set of environmental issues for another. Thirdly, is the nickel processing plant's poor labor standards. Recently, three Chinese workers at an Indonesian nickel industrial complex on Sulawesi Island have filed a complaint with the country's Human Rights Commission over poor workplace conditions. Amar Law Firm and Public Interest Law Office said the factory's workers experienced poor workplace conditions, including a lack of proper safety and respiratory gear, working long hours without breaks, and pay cuts. Passports belonging to Chinese nationals were also withheld, and there was a ban on unionizing. Fourthly, recent legislation, like the Omnibus Law on Job Creation, have lowered ESG standards, particularly around public participation. For example, environmental impact assessments can only be challenged by people who are directly affected. Such people often don't have the means to launch lawsuits. In addition, local governments have little power over environmental permits in their districts. As a result, these ore processing plants also fail to cater to indigenous people. There have also been examples of the mistreatment of indigenous communities, land clearing, encroachment upon burial grounds, and use of police to apprehend peaceful protesters near the mines of Sulawesi Island owned by nickel mining company P.T. Gemma Creasy Perdana, GKP. It is exactly these low ESG standards that have led to the exit of various key Western investors, such as Paris-based hedge fund Hidanova, which sold its 76% stake in the Indonesian nickel mine Mineralindo Morawali. However, Bloomberg UK reports that Tesla, Chinese automaker BYD, and South Korea's Hyundai Motor Corporation are already in the process of finalizing deals with Indonesia's EV industry. This, in total, is projected to bring in a total of 30 30 billion US dollars of investments into the US economy. So whether ESG investing continues to be a deterrent to the success of the Indonesia economy will depend on how investors will react to these companies' deals being finalized and whether Indonesia is able to promise the global community healthier environmental and labor standards. This leads us to the worse, a question of Indonesian raw material value. Let's assume that Indonesia makes it over the ESG hurdle, although the president's statements and the statistics in early 2023 paint a pretty picture of the appreciation and growth of the Indonesian nickel exports industry. The president's protectionist agenda may not be a universally applicable strategy to all raw materials in Indonesia. Chris Nagupta from the Australian National University summarized this in clear detail. In his article, he cited that statistics suggesting the exponential increase in the value of nickel failed to account for trade-offs that have occurred in other aspects of the Indonesian economy. The export bans, although a great incentive for exporting value-added nickel products, fail to consider the potential loss in government revenue from tax incentives and export duties, and the loss in opportunity to make use of the global appreciation in nickel prices. Furthermore, the export bans on any further raw materials simply wouldn't be as effective as the export bans on low-grade nickel. Indonesian nickel possesses three key qualities which gives it inherent value, namely that nickel is a scarce resource, that Indonesia has the largest natural endowment out of any country for nickel and currently favorable market conditions. Indonesia's production in nickel amounted to an estimated 1.6 million metric tons in 2022, and it is estimated that Indonesia holds 21 million metric tons of nickel reserves, sharing first place with Australia, with the second largest reserve belonging to Brazil and fizzling out to Russia in third place, who only has 7.5 5 metric tons and is currently warlocked with Ukraine. This essentially gives Indonesia a temporary and natural monopoly over nickel. Finally, the growth of Indonesia's nickel market has much to do with the recent hype surrounding electronic vehicles and the production of electric batteries, and China's high demand for low-grade nickel in steel production. 
So what seems to be the problem? These are a specific set of conditions that are not necessarily met by any other natural resource other than Indonesian nickel. Comparative advantage is an economy's ability to produce a particular good or service at a lower opportunity cost than its trading partners. Taking bauxite as an example, in 2021, Indonesia will not even fall in the top five countries with the largest bauxite reserves. It even loses out to first place by a far margin, with Australia Australia producing 110 million tons of bauxite and Indonesia only producing roughly a tenth of that at 18 million tons. There are also no set of specific market conditions that have made aluminum, the resultant product of bauxite processing, any more valuable than it was 10 years ago. Hence, assuming that the export ban on bauxite goes through, if the cost of processing bauxite locally rises, international importers would simply switch to cheaper alternatives. This calls into question whether the value of Indonesian raw material exports will really rise as a result of the export bans if a similar strategy were to be applied to all raw materials in the near future. But most importantly, and the ugliest of the three issues is the president's willingness to risk Indonesia's trade relationships. Recently, the European Union-Indonesian dispute reached a preliminary conclusion. In 2021, the EU submitted a request to the WTO for the establishment of a panel to examine whether Indonesia's ban on nickel ore exports and nickel ore domestic processing requirements breach international trade rules. The WTO panel has since ruled against Indonesia's export ban as unlawful. The ruling confirmed that Indonesia's nickel exports did not fall under under the exemptions for prohibitions to relieve critical shortages, and neither was it justified to secure compliance for relevant laws and regulations in Indonesia under the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs 1994. The recommendations by the WTO panel call for Indonesia to revert its policies in conformity with WTO global trade rules. However, it seems that President Widodo is not going down without a fight. Not only has Indonesia launched an appeal to the WTO panel, President Widodo has also expressed public disapproval against the WTO ruling. Speaking at an investment event, President Widodo stated that, quote, Indonesia wants to be a developed country. We want to create jobs. If we are scared of being sued and we step back, we will not be a developed country, end quote. This signals an element of recalcitrance by the Indonesian government to comply with the recommendations of the WTO panel. Why is this dangerous? Let us assume that the appeal fails. Indonesia has committed to continue the onshore processing of laterite ore in contravention of the WTO's recommendations. Furthermore, it made public announcements to place further bans on the export of raw materials. These actions may ultimately spark what is known as retaliation. If within 20 days after the expiry of the reasonable period of time, the parties have not agreed on satisfactory compensation, the complainant may ask the WTO dispute settlement body, otherwise known as the DSB, for permission to impose trade sanctions against the respondent that has failed to implement. The level of suspension of obligations authorized by the DSB must be equivalent to the level of nullification or impairment caused by the Indonesian government. Since the Indonesian government has banned exports of raw nickel ore, it may be possible that WTO members will request trade sanctions in the form of tariffs in a similar industry. Based on Indonesia's import value in 2021, this could result in an increase in tariffs implemented against iron and steel imports an Indonesian imports market which amounts to 2.6 billion US dollars. Moreover, if these sanctions prove to be ineffective, the complaining parties still have the option to impose sanctions on a different sector as well. A good parallel to illustrate the harms of retaliatory tariffs would be the US-Chinese trade war in 2018. When the US government enacted tariffs against its foreign trade partners, these trading partners responded with retaliatory tariffs that raised tariff levels from 7.5% to 23.5% for over 6,341 products. This resulted in 15.6 billion US dollars in trade losses for the United States. Although this was offset by 
a 13.5 billion US dollar redistribution of its trade channels to new trading partners, it also caused major ripple effects in consumption and employment growth locally in the United States. If a similar situation is observed in Indonesia, it could compound upon the labor issues faced by Indonesia. However, retaliation is an act of final resort and is rarely ever implemented in fear of violating the core principles of free trade practiced under the WTO. Moreover, if any country wanted to impose retaliation measures against Indonesia, they would have to require prior approval by the DSB. Even then, the measures would only come in the form of trade sanctions, a bullet which President Widodo seems to be adamant about biting. As his term ends in 2024, the president will have limited time to ensure that his plans for developing the Indonesian economy come to fruition. Will these export bans result in a more prosperous Indonesian economy? Will they be the beginning of the end of economic relationships between Indonesia and the West? And will the subsequent president of Indonesia inherit an economy poised for exponential growth at the expense of its environment and its people? Only time will tell in the race for a podium in the fourth industrial revolution.